Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, this is Nerds to Hearing, and welcome to this brand new guide for Crusader Kings 3. Today we're going to look at some fun and interesting starting positions, and this will vary from historical figures, as ever you might expect on this channel, to other more small and obscure, yet I think rather fascinating beginnings. Let's begin with what has been my favourite playthrough to date, the County of Lecce down in the heel of Italy. Now they are a tricky beginning, just a single county, 168 levies, and a leader who's not exactly famed for his martial ability. So we're going to have to play a little bit of a diplomatic game and try to figure out how to make this work. Now it should be said, some of our neighbours are a bit bigger than us and if you're not careful, you could get yourself eaten very quickly indeed. But as you can see here, we are part of the Byzantine Empire and that hopefully will keep you safe. Good old Basil here did actually save me quite early on when I got besieged by quite a large force. And that should keep you safe in the short term until you can build up a little bit of a power base. Now, we are actually, of course, just trying to create a bigger foothold foothold, foothold in Italy over here. So uh, let's take a good look at our leader and see what we can do with him. As for the great leader himself, well, Count I said Doris is a magnificent, learned man. And that is going to be crucial because that piety of 2.5 a month is what's going to help us launch the Holy Wars. Yes, to the north, we've got ourselves some pagans. And most importantly, we've got Ragusa, which not only is quite high up in the development stakes, or at least relative to the general area, it's development of eight, which isn't too bad considering what's on offer. But more importantly, it is its own duchy. Now, of course, if you're playing yourself as a count early on, you don't want to take a load of land just for it to spread between all your children. So a duchy title is key early game. So if you want to go get yourself a duchy, Dubrovnik are a nice juicy target. They've actually We could actually beat them as they are right now. Magnificent. But of course, what we do want to do is get ourselves a good alliance. And that is where the children come involved. Let's start with our daughter Euphrasia then, who is incredibly useful to get you a powerful alliance. Now I got her straight up married to the Prince of Benevento next door. That gave us a nice pile of troops. They have about a thousand men at their disposal. And with a decent bit of prestige at the start of the game, you can use his army to win the wars that you want. And indeed, that is very much the way I played the early game here. It's an intriguing start because in many ways, you do not have an awful lot to work with. Your younger son is a vengeful craven who I spent most of his reign basically trying to get him killed. And uh, yeah, his younger brother is just a lunatic who got murdered by his brother at 28. So yeah, it's not exactly the best of starts here but I found it a fun challenge indeed between the sort of position on the end of the Byzantine Empire the fact that you've got all of the uh, yeah the orthodoxy versus Catholicism and the paganism and the Muslims here you can end up with a really odd campaign in fact let me take you to um oh, this guy's grandson who um yeah ends up looking over a very strange empire indeed into the chaotic future of 940 AD and it must be said that our good old grandson Duke Helias resides over what can only be described as a bizarre looking realm. Nonetheless, I think he's done quite well from the early days of a single county in Lecce. I think that's what I loved about this campaign. There was, there was no real obvious direction to go and so I just kind of pounced on opportunities as they came. And um, well, I should point out this was, my, this was my first game on Crusader Kings 3 so I didn't really know what I was doing. But I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, yeah, actually, my son, my son is uh, the king of Bulgaria as well as my vassal. Yeah, it's a very strange game, but that's the Crusader Kings free for you. I thoroughly enjoyed this particular campaign as Lecce, so I would heartily recommend it. It's um, yeah, a small start, but one that can go a lot of very strange directions. My second choice is a little bit more historical, and I'm basing it off this scenario here, the Wrath of the Northmen, which looks at the Viking invasions of the 9th century in England. Now, we should probably look at this guy here, Earl Alfred of Wessex, who the game says is hard, but honestly, I don't think it's quite as tricky as it says here. Now, this chap here is a big historical character, Alfred the Great, I think the only English king with that epithet, in fact. Alfred the Great would go on and help kick out a big pile of the Vikings until I think Athelstan would finally rid us of the Viking threat, or at least in England anyway. But no, he's not actually the one I'm going to look at here. He's actually surprisingly easy because he's a really strong character and if you get rid of his older brother or the one of the four that was still left alive by this point, yeah, you end up having all of Wessex and you're in a pretty strong position. The guy I'm looking at is a little bit more obscure. 
Only a little bit more obscure though, because he's simply not one of these five options here. The guy I want to look at is this chap here, good old King Erla of Northumbria. Now, he's really important. He's kind of the whole reason this situation is going on. As it says here, the great Viking hero Ragnar Ludbrook was thrown into a pit of snakes by him to die. Indeed, he is now going to feel the wrath of all of his sons. So, um, yes, if we want to start off as him, we're really, really going to find ourselves in a difficult position. So let's have a good look at him. Here we are then with Petty King Erla Oswaldson of Northumbria. And it must be said, he does look like one of the major players in the game. So why exactly have I chosen him? Well, as I said, the historical position means that he is pretty much ready to be murdered brutally from every angle. And indeed, he's already got two wars on here. There are 9,000. 9,000 men here, and that's not even all of them, by the way. He's got himself a war to go and lose Lovian in the north, and then he's also going to go and lose all of Northumberland over in the south. Um, you do have these two allies here, but honestly, you are designed to die pretty much in the first year of the game. So really, what I like about this start is it's a bit of a scenario. Not one that they actually made as one of the main options for this particular campaign, but... I think it's an interesting one, because how are you going to survive? You've somehow got to win, or at least white piece, one of these two wars here at the start, because otherwise you're going to end up unlanded, and you're going to have game over before the year's even out. Into the third year of the war, and it's pretty much, yeah, it's, um, it's already over, and that is the game. That is the game right there. Three years we lasted. Better than the three months of real history, but um, perhaps we should get back to the drawing board and try and figure out how we're going to survive this little scenario here. So what I like about this particular start is just how ridiculously doomed your character is. It's uh, just a bit of a weird challenge more than anything else. Now you are almost certainly going to lose at least one of these two wars. If you can win one of them, kudos to you. I, I haven't managed that in the few times I've had a go at it, but you can manage to wipe peace out of one, probably the war in the north here. But anyway, I'll leave that to you. You have a few options. But honestly, not a lot. You've got no allies, your diplomacy is terrible, your marshal is poor. You obviously have yourself a very good intrigue stat, but um, your children aren't very useful, so there's not really going to be alliances there. Indeed, your daughter's married to um, you know, one of your rivals who's trying to kill you. Not particularly helpful. And your son is married to some nobody. But this um, this gives us a little bit of a chance. We, uh, we need some children to marry off to get an alliance or two. Now, obviously... Your, uh, your wife could give yourself a child in nine months' time, but you could just go and lop off her head. So to be honest, murdering your son's wife is probably not the worst place to start. Having gone down the route of schema then, we can have two hostile schemes. So our son's wife, of course, is going to go down to allow us to have some alliances, and we also need to get rid of these rivals. Now, this guy over here is probably the easier of the three to kill. We want to go and get him dealt with quickly. The high chieftess here can be bribed, without too many problems. Indeed, I think they've all got someone you should be able to uh, get on side. So getting rid of them isn't really going to end the wars, but they're always going to come for you. They're always going to be trying to kill you. So if you can get rid of them, then hopefully their successes don't hate you quite as much. And, well, as long as they don't find out, I suppose. And then you can hopefully get on with your life. In the meantime, whilst you're killing all of these people um, and trying to hopefully get some uh, children and get their alliances set up. We need to think about how we're actually going to survive the war because, yeah, you can kill these guys all you want, but you've somehow got to not lose all your land in the meantime. This is pretty much a perfect run right now, so we've got ourselves either the boneless ready to be assassinated, 95% chance, and war score on that war is on plus 18%. Pretty much they're ready for a white piece. One, one mark off it. So you can see there, a bit from long war, and mainly from holding the objectives. Now, um, you can probably tell this, this siege is pretty close. This one, this one comes pretty much down to the wire. Oh yes, I do love surprise visits. And we're just waiting for that to hit 19 before this siege is out. And uh, yeah, there we go, 10 days, 10 days to go. White piece, they will accept. They might actually take this before the white piece officially even comes through, but it doesn't matter with that we have managed to hold off and uh yeah even if you lose this war now even if you lose it you've got a few a few places to hold on to yeah this one isn't going quite so well we'll get on with killing him in time but now we can even give up this war and we'll still have ourselves 
and northern holdings, which means we can hope, hope and pray that we can murder our rivals and get on with our lives. It is possible then to make it a few years into the game holding on to your northern territories at the very least. And uh, from here, hopefully you haven't ruined all of your uh, diplomacy too much. Um, in, so we've got smallpox. Brilliant! <laughs> we've got smallpox and we've got an extra child as well. So uh, hopefully you haven't ruined all your diplomacy too much in the meantime. Of course, once you survive those two wars and you're a generation down the line, you're pretty much going to find yourself in the same position as these other realms here, picking off the small guys, trying to create yourselves a nice core to your kingdom. But we are on the back foot. We've already lost a lot of ground here. Alba are already a kingdom of 5,000, so we're not as strong as we might be with a normal start. But I kind of like that about this. And I, I kind of like the fact that as Northumbria, we're um, we're an interesting little kingdom, actually, because historically they've, they've kind of been their own separate identity between Scotland and England. If you don't know exactly where the border is, by the way, it is literally right cutting through the middle here between Carlisle and Berwick. And essentially, Northumbria got squeezed out through time, half into Scotland, half into England. It's still actually the uh, the county of Northumberland up here. But I like the idea of playing with history. I like the fact that we could become the dominant power in Britain here. So um, yeah, I'm going to leave this one here for now. But it's been a yeah an interesting one to start so far on the back foot. Over to West Africa then, and it must be said this is completely dominated by the Empire of Ghana here. It is a titan among many small chiefdoms, and I, I guess you could take over them and just start bulldozing your way through this. I suppose the idea being that you can create an army strong enough to go and smash up Europe. There's something enticing about reversing the roles of history and taking Sub-Saharan Africa over to Europe instead of the other way around. But I don't really want to start with Ghana. I personally like some of the smaller kingdoms and chiefdoms around here. Manding's quite an interesting one, particularly if you like to fulfil some of history. The Cater dynasty would go and rule over the Empire of Mali into the future. But no, I'm going to look a little bit smaller than that. And I like these guys over here, the good old chiefdom of Jonoff. Why specifically the chieftain of Jonoff then, you ask? Well, for me it's kind of twofold. Firstly, it's because I love Jonoff Rice, and quite frankly, I love the idea of winning a cultural victory, in my mind, by taking over the world with a rice dish. But that aside, I also think they're at an interesting crossroads here. We find ourselves with the Islamic peoples to the north, who we can kind of reach up to without too much trouble, and we're also not quite on the border with the Empire of Ghana, which means it gives us a bit of time to start to gobble up our little local region here. Of course, one of the big issues of the 867 start is Confederate partition here, and all children inherit equally in this society. So your daughters will inherit as well as your sons, and that does mean that you're going to have your land spitting up if you're not careful. So duchy titles, and indeed these two kingdom titles, are going to be important to keep your lands within your own dynasty. That said though, I do think you're in quite a nice position here to build up a bit of a power base before Ghana attack you. And be warned, they will attack you, and it was one hell of a war when this went down with me. Before we get to any of that though, let's have a good look at our starting leader, Gear Indie of Jolof, who quite frankly varies a lot whenever you reload the game, so don't read too much into these stats and traits but he will have himself a wife and a child. 500 of men, pretty standard, and you'll notice it's pretty similar to a lot of the other guys around here. But these two over here are part of your duchy, and they are the weaker guys, so you're probably going to want to head to them first. In some ways this works out quite well, because you can use up your piety to declare war, and then the prestige can be used to create your men-at-arms. It's not gold, but prestige that does it for these particular chaps, so... That can work out well in the short term, although come the medium term, once you've taken over all the lands of your own religion, it starts to get a bit irritating. You don't really want to be wasting all your prestige on upkeeping these guys. It ends up being um, a bit tricky. Keeping prestige high is going to be really important for this particular campaign. Into the future then, and the Great War with the Kingdom of Ghana, which it must be said brought up a few of the issues with this particular campaign. Number one would be that you can see here, uh, we've got the succession of the Kingdom of Kabu over here, which is actually run by my brother. Basically, the mother here had too many children, and he just created that title and gave it to them. Um, that can be a big problem. So be wary of that. That caused a few issues, because she died in the middle of the war here, and it meant that I lost big chunks of land. Silen Kabu broke off in the middle of the war. Um, as you can see, minus 69. 
they do have themselves a big pile of troops who can slaughter you. Now eventually you can see there are a few battles at the end there. I have managed to turn this around despite, it says they're minus 69. I did win this war in the end I captured this and then declared a white peace. Um, and after that I managed to consolidate and then I was strong enough to hold off against these big powers. But it should be said it's very potentially dangerous. You need to keep a close eye on what's going on with the Kingdom of Ghana. Make sure you've got a plan up your sleeve to deal with them when eventually that problem arises. A few years further on in this chap's reign than you can see now, I've reigned in the amount of children I've got. I've got myself as big of a kingdom as any of the others in Africa here, and we're in a good position to hopefully start focusing more to the north. It should be said that uh, so far, so far these guys haven't been too much of an obstacle. One day we'll make it into Europe and smash them up. I do find around about the third, fourth generation is when you just decide, am I going to bother continuing with this game or not? I must say, with this one, I do feel like, yeah, I reckon there's still some more legs in this. I've survived that huge war, which made me cry immensely. It was about 15 years long, by the way. Um, almost never ending, but having made it through that, I, I still feel like there's legs to go in this campaign. It's been, it's been an intriguing one. One that's a bit out of my comfort zone. Very much used to playing with the European nations here. But I do think, yeah, Joloff. It's been a, been a fun ride. And one day, one day our good old culture of Wolof Joloff rice will spread throughout the world. That's all for now, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you've enjoyed our little dabble into Crusader Kings 3 here today. Of course, a big part of the beauty of this game is the sheer variety of starts that are available. And I barely even scratched the surface here. This is just three interesting beginnings that I found. Uh, do let me know in the comments below any particularly interesting starts that you've come across. Um, actually, potentially, any that might be good for a little series, because I'm not, not averse to that idea whatsoever. Of course, most of the videos here on the channel are Total War based, and that will very much remain the case. However, I do like to dabble into new games every so often, and Crusader Kings 3 does seem rather popular among, well, myself to be honest, but also among the Total War community. So I'd be interested to see how this video here does. If it does well, then yeah, we might well be seeing more of this kind of content in the future. For now, though, I will leave you. I am Thomas, this is Tenez Human, and this has been a little guide to some great starts in Crusader Kings 3. Thank you, and goodbye. Go, my pappies, go! Hunt down the German dogs. My chariots are complete lunatic. Stop charging into the spears! Stop charging into the spears! Why did these guys not break? Everyone else has fled. Go home! Go home! What is happening at... The chariots.